So our next speaker uh, is is the man that really needs no introduction, but I'll, I'll give it. A, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to give you a short one. To keep it brief, uh, Grant and his wife Carol have lived on Hornby Island for almost 25 years. He was the uh, he was on the board of Conservancy for I think almost 15 years, and for the past 10 years has been the chair of Conservancy, and really the the uh, inspirational leader of our of our group. Grant is also one of our two islands trust representatives, an active professional forester, and has worked with many uh, First Nations, uh, coastal First Nations up and down the coast on tre uh, treaty negotiations, forestry management, and land use planning. Today, Grant will be providing us with an overview of Hornby's forests, and uh, Grant looks, also looks forward to taking people on a walk tomorrow morning uh, as one of our forest Forestry, forest walks, I should say. Grant Scott. Thanks, Don. So, good morning, everybody. Kevin and Barb, thanks very much for speaking about cedar. I'm going to concentrate more on Douglas fir, but as we're also aware, there's the uh, we're in a mainly Douglas fir zone, but there's lots of cedar trees in there as well, as, as you pointed out. So um, this is what I'm going to talk about, an overview of Hornby's forests. So who's got the... Yes. Yeah, keep... Beyond my pay grade, yeah, yeah. so I got my own little pointer deal here too. Oh. Let me just see what. Whoa! So, um, so I don't want to burn up my 20 minutes here, Don, too quickly. So this is the range of uh, Doug, Douglas fir. Uh, it goes, as you can see there, it goes all the way up from the interior of BC. It comes all the way down the, to the coast mount, uh, the, the Rocky Mountains here. It actually goes into Alberta a little bit, and it, you can see it's on Vancouver. Now that, this map isn't exactly the scale of it, but the coastal Douglas fir goes down down this way, and this there, there's three different varieties actually of, of Douglas fir: the coastal Douglas fir, mm -hmm. the mountain Douglas fir, and, call, and there's the Mexican Douglas fir. So it's all the way down here. So that's just the species. So there's also the um, the different. Biogeochromatic zones. So here, here we are. You can see us on on Hornby here. But what's really interesting is Douglas fir goes all the way along here, all the way up. It actually goes up into the Balakula Valley up in here, and obviously in the interior. So you can see this. This is the wet, the wet uh, biogeochromatic zone here. This is the uh, sheltered zone inside the Co the uh, Beaufort Range here. And then you can see it comes all the way down into the, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Vancouver. <coughs> oh, here's Vancouver. I mean, an interesting little note on the effect of biogeoclimatic. Bio is biological, plant-based, climate, clim climatic, obviously. These are the different zones. Look, look at this here. That gets 12 inches of rain here. Mount Seymour, which is about there, gets 150 mm -hmm. inches a year. So that just shows you how these biogeochromatic zones have such a massive impact on, on the tree species, where they are. And where we are here is in the drier part of it, sheltered by the, the, the Beaufort Range and the mountains. And as you go in here, you start to see how dry it is, these different dry zones. And this, of course, is where the major fires are. But what's unusual this year is we had a, f a fire on the Alberni Highway. Remember that? So as John was talking about last night, we're not immune to what's going on here. We had, uh, I think that's about where Mount Washington was. There's a number of fires right in here. 
so yeah, that I don't want to dwell on that, but it, just to show you the diversity up there. So the next one, please. So this, this shows more what's called the CDF, Coastal Douglas Fir Zone, which is, you can see obviously where we are. And this is the drier Douglas Fir because there's Douglas Fir further. Douglas Fir does not go on the west coast of Vancouver Island. It's too wet out there. And the, the soil's incredibly acidic as well. And so you can see, this is the sort of sh the sheltered Douglas Fir. It goes up from Lundquart and, and uh, up on Savory there, it comes down, Hornby Denman. Part, it, it's interesting, I wouldn't have thought it's just part of Texadia, but obviously it is, and it's that dry, drier Douglas fir. So there's, there's where we are, and this affects, as, as Elder Barb was talking about, it, it affects, you know, what's going, there's Comox. See, it, it, it's, it's not that much different, but the, when, when she was speaking about the pen latch, they're right in here, right? Barb, that, that biggest, the biggest unbelievable village in the whole Strait of Georgia, Salish Sea, was on Denman Point. Wow. On Denman Point. When you're on a ferry coming from Buckley Bay, if you look to the left, there's a point. It's the biggest midden bar, if you don't mind me saying, in the, in the whole coast. And it's very, very interesting. There's some interesting books written about it, about the Pentlatch people, who, who after the um, pandemic moved to Comox, uh, with the uh, Comox people, right? Have I got that right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So anyway, there's very interesting history going on here. God, I'm burning my 20 minutes up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here, all right. So, okay, so here's Hornby. So, I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, but you can see the extent of forest. And barely, basically very, very little of this is what you'd call old growth. You, you can go in the forest and see big second growth trees that are taking on old growth attributes, thick bark, actually some of them even have burn marks on them, but they're not, they're actually second growth. Because Douglas fir grows very, it'll grow, you know, you can get a 30 year old Douglas fir tree that's 50, 60 feet high and it's this big in diameter. They grow, they put a tap root down, as you mentioned, and they get into the, the water and the nutrient, more so than cedar. And, uh, that was really interesting what you pointed out about that. cedar roots go like this, and they tend to blow over easier. So you can see here, so what, actually I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna burn up too much of my time here. <laughs> Don's gonna be on my case in about, what, 10 minutes from now? Okay, so next one please. So if you have any questions, so the obvious question you have is what did the, before it was logged, before it was cleared for farming, what did it look like? Now that's an old veteran fir that's probably 150 or 180 feet tall and that's to a broken top. So it was probably 30 feet taller than that originally. What the top either got blown off in the winds or maybe hit by lightning. Mm -hmm. So that's the extent, this, this picture is over near uh, Savoy Road. I'm not gonna say whose property it's on. But anyway, it's down there, it just shows you the size. The diameter of that tree is about six to eight feet in diameter. So that's what was here originally. That's what Elder Barb's people were on this island using with the cedar that were massive before the settlers got here and altered the, the forest landscape on the island. Next one, please. So this shows some of those large old growth fir. And you can see what the attributes that makes them that way is that really, really thick bark. That bark is about this thick. It's about almost a foot thick. Why? Because fire would burn through and you can see the black on the, well, I'm supposed to use this thing, see the black on, on there? That's from the fires going through here back maybe 200 years ago, right? And the First Nations people that were here would burn through here, especially out, this is out near um, um, Heliwell, right? Yeah. So this is where it was burned off for the camas to encourage the 
the, the, the camas and the, and the other uh, metal roots that people needed to get the carbohydrates, because that was part of the whole diet thing. Is that, is that right? Am I saying that right? Thank you. So anyway, the reason, why are these here? That's the interesting question. Why are they left behind? Why didn't they log it when they logged everything else 100, 100 or so years ago? It's because, see these big bumps? These are probably rotten inside. They left them because they had no commercial value. They're beautiful. They'll live another 500 years. That's the amazing nature of these trees. But fortunately, the loggers didn't want them and left them. So if you do that walk, the hell you all walk, you know, and you come around, and you come around through these as you come around the point there, and you come back into the forest. It's just a beautiful, beautiful example. And if you really want to see what was here originally, you, you've got to go over to Port Alberni and see the, what do you call that, Grove? Cathedral Grove. That's where you'll really see what it was like all, all, all along the coast. And that's just starting to get into the, a little wetter. But it's just such an amazing forest over there. Next, please. Don, how am I doing? Oh, great. So this, this is called uh, Two Old Vets in Paradise. <laughs> so I don't know who this dude here is, but you can see that's a, that's a fir tree that's actually still alive. And it's, we'll see it tomorrow on the, when we do the Lee, Lee Smith walk. It's a beautiful big old tree there. And it's just been, the pileated woodpeckers have been poking away at it here. And every one of those little holes will be a wealth of bugs and all these different things that the birds go in. When you go there, and if you click on here, one of those apps that tells you the names of birds, from the sound, mm -hmm. pileated woodpeckers and ravens are what you get up there at the most, those bad boy ravens, the ones you got the pictures of. They're the ones that live at our place yeah. and drive us crazy. You know, they go through the garbage and make a little, you know, those guys. <laughs> so, so anyway, it's a beautiful big tree. You can see my arms are stretched out basically six feet wide. So that tree's pretty close to six feet in diameter. It's probably 700, 800 years old. And why is that tree there? It's because of the way the slope of the, the hill, it's not really a mountain, but that comes down. And it, as the rain comes down, it washes the nutrients and it, and it builds up down at the bottom of the hill. Makes sense, doesn't it? The nutrients come down, the water comes down, it builds up a really big soil base. And of course, that's what the trees are. Sword fern is the highest indicator on the coast of where you're gonna get these big, massive trees. So this is all that biogeochromatic stuff, which you go to UBC, Where's Laura? She teaches stuff. There she is back there. She'll be talking about some. I hope I'm not stealing any of your thunder. I'm shifting on the fly. <laughs> Good, thank you. So, yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. So, next one, please. So, this is a beautiful meadow of second growth. And you, Don, where's your name? Your, Name down here. <laughs> anyway, Don took all these photographs. Please. Hey, Don. Give them all. <laughs> going for a walk with Don is really interesting going through this stuff because he sees it from a photographer's eye. I see it quite differently. So between the two of us, it's, it's really a lot of fun and very interesting. And if you could, if you had Barb there as well, it would be really even. <laughs> So, now, here's, a, here's an interesting question for you. There's no stumps here. Why is that? It's because this was cleared, probably originally for logging, and then it was cleared for probably pasture. So when you see a forest like this with no stumps, it was cleared more than just log, because when you go and you go in the bush and you just see logs, you'll see great big, with the spring, board notches in them where they stuck the boards in and they climbed up and they sawed. They were better men than us, Don, I'm sorry, they, to do that kind of stuff. So, uh, so anyway, this, this is a really beautiful example 
of older second growth. These trees are probably 70, 80, maybe 100 years old. And they're, you know, they're getting to be, this one here would be like two, three feet in diameter. So it's a beautiful little glade with the, the grasses underneath it. This is, again, out, out your alleyway, I think, Doug? Yeah, can I just make one comment? I just sure. realized we were talking about it. This glade is actually just above the middens on the east side of uh, Hellywell Park. You know, there's that grassy area and there's all the large middens along there. Right. I'm wondering if this was continually burned off by the First Nations people for cannabis back in the day. Well, maybe, yes, yeah, maybe that's the clearing was, was for that purpose. That, that's a good observation, actually, because I've noticed just in the last 50 years, since I've been coming up here, believe it or not, uh, fishing off off the bluffs there you just see so much less that the fir trees are moving out on the heliwell now i wasn't around when these guys i wasn't around 100 years ago believe it or not <laughs> so close. <laughs> close next one before i embarrass myself further so this is a beautiful little example of a of a of the alder here see this I don't know what that snarly guy is there, but it just shows you the alder and a little a compression somewhere where the water built up. There might have been a little pond there, and then the grasses moved in, and as the grasses moved in, it, it built up the soil as the grasses died. So eventually this would grow in, the alder would fill all that in, it would build it up so that it dried out enough, and then you'd get the trees growing back in. And then this is probably some geologic Thing that maybe happened during the glaciers and left left the you know that that's the fun and beauty of wandering around out there and just looking at this so beautiful piece of grassland there here's Don he got his name on that one <laughs> next please so this is an example of a of a young cedar tree in amongst the fir and you can see it, it's uh, last year it would have shown to be stressed. It would have been probably green, and one of, the, one of the last things a tree does is it puts out a huge number of cones because it wants to get itself into the gene pool, knowing maybe not. I think trees are smarter than us anyway, but maybe not. They don't know intellectually, but they certainly are aware that they, they want to get into the gene pool. So this this guy, it's quite a young tree. But you can see around it, you can even see, this is probably another cedar here. You see this one? You can see all the branches are sort of, it's stressed. This one didn't make it. That's part of the, what John was talking last night and this whole impact of global warming. Please. So this is just a beautiful example looking out again up on the top of Helliwell there, the Arbutus and the, the pine trees here, and uh, you can see fir back in here, just a beautiful glade where it was open enough that probably uh, Elder Barb's people would be out there. That, that's where people would be getting the camas and the roots. And, the, and I really think the First Nations people, without speaking for anybody here, but I think they came here for the same reason we all come here. The beauty of the place, the amazing resources around us. And just sitting up there and looking out over those islands, you know why people were here. So next, please. So it's really interesting. This is, this is the poplar trembling aspen grove when you walk along the beach at Tribune, and you'll see it, uh, and you walk around behind it. It's called trembling aspen. Latin name of it is Populus Tremuloides. <laughs> Tremuloides because it trembles. The leaves don't fall off right away. They sit there. It go like this in the wind. And you can actually hear them. You can hear the forest. It's talking to you. Smarten up. Get your <laughs> together. Anyway, it's just a it's just a great another great picture of Dawn. So you know, if you walk up there, just take a look at those trees through the four seasons. Check them out in the spring. How they look when they all they flush and everything's so green and you hear the birds all around down there. Beautiful place. And of course, I think this whole thing back around there is, is a midden, right? 
people must have been going there for thousands of years. So, beautiful spot. So, look at this. This picture just sums the whole thing up of the beauty of the place. Look at the path, Don, you know, he captures the path, people walking, the old, what do you call those kind of fences? Snake rail fences. The beautiful Gary Oaks. You must have got this in the spring. The way it looks, it looks like it's just flushing. And the green grass. You know, it's just a beautiful example of that Gary Oak forest that we're so fortunate to have on Hornby. And I read somewhere that the coastal Douglas fir is the, is the most threatened small range left of forests in Canada. It's not. This is. How little of that Gary Oak meadow lands are left. How much time have I got? Okay. Okay. So, next, please. So here's these these guys. Don took this picture up at the depot. Well, these guys live at our house. I know they <laughs> because whenever you don't put a rock on the top of the garbage can, you know, they get in there and they they can drag. Stuff all oh, you got that anybody else have that happen to them or they just come and do it to us? <laughs> uh oh, good. Teresa, they get you on they they go over to Denman too, these guys. Okay. This is a beautiful pileated woodpecker that I mentioned that goes into those big furs. That big fur that I've got my arms, I forgot to mention, when we're doing that, there's a nest of you know, one of those beautiful you know, where the birds probably the pileage you dug and there was a beautiful little nest in there, maybe a thrush or a Swainson's, no, Swainson's are in there. Anyway, a bird's nest in there. And here's a little song sparrow that's in the forest. Here's a, a hairy or a downy woodpecker. So I'm kind of hoping maybe one of these years we'll focus, get somebody to speak about the forest birds. You know, and all the other, next pick, please. And all the other amazing, species that are in our forests. Now I'm sad to say, for everybody that's getting excited out there, these are not psilocybin. <laughs> psilocybin grow in a field where there's grass, there's been cow pies, and when you find them, and I just heard this from somebody else, <laughs> when you find them in, the, in, the, in September, and you happen to have a cold beer in your hand, and you eat maybe 10 or 20 of them, all of a sudden the whole field sparkles with psilocybin. Now, I just heard that from somebody. They're not that. They don't, psilocybin don't grow, but they look very, very much like that. These are not liberty caps. So look at the beauty of these fungus mushrooms that live in our forests. That's it. Thank you. Making oh. is when they're when they're expanding these fissures in the in the rock, yeah. it's also changing the course of groundwater that's yeah. available yeah. as well, which could affect the forest yeah. as well as our own source of drinking water. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions for Grant? Yes. I'm just wondering where the um, 
the Gary Oak Grove with the trail and the split rail fence. Where was that shot taken? Uh, that's up on the what's called the High Salal Trail. Yes, that's yeah. uh, at the top part of the park. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's it, it, it private connects. Property, I think. It's, it's private property, yeah. but you're allowed to use that trail. Um, the High Salal oh, okay. property owners allow the public on that trail. Oh, right. yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Could Thank you, you very much. Oh. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do. I got two sure. minutes left. Sure. <laughs> Could you shoot the map up of Horn, please? Something I forgot to mention. <clears throat> now, I tried to say the word fur in your language. Luis, can you repeat it, please? Um, so, Brad was showing me what he had, and uh, it's called La Yach. Yach is uh, the Hulkamitnam word for tree in general, so you'll see that associated with a lot of different tree names. And the, the Hulkamitnam word or the Coast Salish language word for cedar is Achbe. Achbe. Thank you. <laughs> now, there's, there's a cedar, I forgot to mention this. There's a cedar we're going to see tomorrow which could be a culturally modified tree because one side of it, of the cedar, is, it goes up about 20 feet and it comes down like this. And it would be a long time ago because it's all rotten inside now. But I was wondering whether that was a culturally modified tree. We don't see many CMTs here because of, there's so much alteration. But you go up the coast, you know, where I work in the, and there's a lot of CMTs and that's a great evidence of, of First Nations people being there. But the middens around Hornby are quite astounding, you know. Um, the, the ferry landing is an entire midden, yeah. right? Ford's Cove, all, all to, yeah. you know, the, the beaches here, everywhere, you know, you go to Grassy Point, that's, that's a midden. How do I know it's a midden? Clamshells don't crawl up above the waterline on their own. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to point out the importance, and as a trustee, I'm trying to get where these middens are and where this First Nations evidence are mapped out so people will become much more aware of what we have on Hornby Island from a First Nations point of view and what these words are in the language of the people, not in in our language. So I'm hoping we can maybe contribute work to that as conservancy and with the trust. Don, I'm out of here. <laughs>